these things. Now, what's in the name? Rather a lot, it seems, when it comes to Islamic State, the extreme Sunni Islamist group now occupying large chunks of Iraq and Syria, who took the credit for the deadly attack in Tunisia last week. David Cameron has called on the BBC to stop using the term Islamic State, claiming that the group is neither Islamic nor a state. But how does he know? The Prime Minister is not a theologian or an expert on Islamic thought or texts. Can you really isolate the group from its religious roots? Could you separate the Spanish Inquisition from Catholicism or the Crusades from Christianity? Like religiously inspired violence from the past, don't we need to understand its Islamic context to counter it? We turn to historian and author Tom Holland. This is his Take of the Week. It may not seem that the Islamic State and David Cameron have a huge amount in common, but on one thing they do seem to be agreed, and that is that they have the right to say who is and who is not an authentic Muslim. That's not my name. That's not my name. That's not my name. I'm sure that the Prime Minister, when earlier this week he denied that the Islamic State was authentically Islamic, did so for the best and the most principled of reasons, but I still think that it was a mistake. Um, to say that the fighters of the Islamic State are not Muslims, that in effect they're heretics, is exactly to replicate the strategy of the Islamic State itself, whose ideologues are very keen on branding those Muslims with whom they do not agree as apostates, um, the better to dehumanise and then ultimately to kill them. And I'm not convinced that this is really the kind of strategy that Western leaders should be copying. But I think it's also akin to putting a sticking plaster on a, a very deeply buried thorn. However painful, however awkward it may be to face up to, it seems to me indisputable that the fighters of the Islamic State, when they do much of what they do, genuinely believe themselves to be inspired by Quranic mandates, by the sayings that traditionally attributed to the Prophet, and indeed by the example of the Prophet himself and of the first generation of Muslims. Now it's evident that their behaviour is not synonymous with Islam, that it's being condemned by Muslims across the world, but if it's not to be described as Islamic in any way, it's hard to know how it should be described. And it's not just me who thinks this. Um, in an online poll held in Saudi Arabia last year, 92% of Saudis thought that the behaviour of the Islamic State was indeed compatible with Islam and with Islamic laws. That's not my name. That's not my name. That's not my name. There's something incredibly brutal and sanguinary about the literalism with which the Islamic State interpret Islam. But if indeed it is to be defined as something distinct from what people want to call real Islam, then it's absolutely essential that a firewall between the two be clearly established. And at the moment, I don't see that happening. Referring to so-called Islamic State is a bit like referring to so-called cancer. It does not make the problem go away. And from his home in South London to our own little home in the heart of Westminster, Tom, welcome. Now, some people watching will say, why are we arguing about terrorist nomenclature when our people have been gunned down on a beach? Why does it matter? Well, I, I, I actually, I would agree. I think that this entire debate about what we should be calling Islamic State is indicative of, of the poverty of uh, uh, government reactions, media reactions. I think that what is happening... Um, in the Islamic world is of profound historical significance. Um, Islam is going through, I think, an existential crisis at the moment, bred of all kinds of circumstances and causes. Um, but it is clearly having a seismic impact, not just on the Islamic world, but on the West as well. And here we are debating what we should call this. Group. But you think we have to understand that it, uh, is it existential crisis, as you call it, to be able to understand Islamic State? Well, I think that, that, that everyone who is worried about the future of Islam needs to. Um, 
obviously that's true of, of everyone affected by it, but I think it's particularly true of Muslims because ultimately uh, it is only out of Islam that the solution to this mm. crisis is going to come. And I think that saying this has nothing whatsoever to do with Islam in a way is overly palliative. It, 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 it removes the sense of urgency that I, I, I think that everyone concerned with this issue should be feeling in, as I said in the film, erecting a firewall between the practices of Islamic State and what perhaps we could call traditional Islam, normative Islam. Because what we need to do is to say, well, why? In what way are the actions of Islamic State when they seem to be following the actions of Muhammad or Quranic mandates? In what way are they not Islamic? We need to establish that absolutely clearly. And at the moment, I do not think that that is being established. Uh, Alice, is it wrong to use the name Islamic State for fear of offending uh, uh, Muslims, even if it's accurate? I, I think what David Cameron was trying to do was to avoid a kind of sense of moral equivalence between, as it were, us and people that he wants to define as people just going in there and wiping out innocent British tourists. But I agree with, with Tom that I think that language develops. A few years ago, insofar as we might talk about an Islamic state, we might be talking about Saudi Arabia or mm. one of the other Islamic states. Islamic State have chosen to call themselves Islamic State for their own reasons. That, I think, has become widely accepted. And I think we're pushing water uphill if we try to stop that. I mean, you, the Prime Minister would have to accept that Saudi Arabia is an Islamic State. Uh, and there are many similarities between what that Islamic State does and what this Islamic State does. I think there are some similarities, but I think there is nonetheless a lot of difference between an Islamic State and the organisation yeah. that describes itself as Islamic State. Uh, I think this whole debate has been tiresome. I think it's been tiresome for the reasons that uh, Tom has uh, mentioned this evening. I think it's also been tiresome because it's been yet another opportunity for the government to attack the BBC. I mean, as far as I know, this organisation calls itself Islamic State. We all understand what we mean when they're described mm. as Islamic State. That they want to establish a state and that they are Islamic are two indisputable factors. Uh, and I think the problem is that the so-called, that they, I think, I think so-called can be applied to state. I'm not sure it can be applied to Islamic. The Islamic part. And that's well, it's the, not yet a state. There's we no, exactly. Right. But it may be heading that way. Well, it's I, now I, levying taxes and I, I think organizing yeah, things. I think it's more of a state than, say, the IRA was an army and. We didn't go around <laughs> saying the so-called Irish Republican army. The Prime Minister claims it's the perversion of a great religion. And many people would agree with that. What say you? Well, I think that it is um, dangerous to assume that there is some authentic version of a faith when you do not belong to that faith. I have no doubt that um, many, probably most Muslims, do indeed think that there is a correct form of Islam, and probably they would think that the correct form of Islam is the one that they themselves practice. Mm. But I think that if you're not a Muslim, you can recognise that Islam is an expression of human culture like any other, and that essentially what it is, is a dialogue between people and a given body of texts and traditions. Mm. And what emphasis is given to those texts and traditions is up to the believers. Well, well, and, this... so, and so to talk about perversions implies that there's a normality. And well, I... this is got You bring it to the heart because this is what... This is really all to do with what some scholars call the hard texts, those parts of the Quran and the Hadiths that uh, Islamic State uses to justify its brutality. And it's about the interpretation of these hard texts. Now, the Old Testament is full of hard texts as well. But over years, Christian scholars have reinterpreted them or they ignore them uh, or they put them in context. Is that happening in the Muslim world? Well, a good example. In the Quran, it is mandated that um, Jews and Christians, peoples of the book, should be subjected to a tax called the jizya. And the, in paying this tax, they should feel their subordination and indeed their humiliation. And this was um, a fact of Islamic empires for most of history. Um, in the 19th century and into the 20th century, this practice was abolished, chiefly due to the influence of um, Western notions of human rights bred of the French Revolution. Now, Islamic State have reintroduced that. Um, Christians who are in Mosul and northern so Iraq have to backwards. pay. Yeah, cool. so, but the question I think that, let's call it mainstream Islam, needs to answer is why is that wrong? 
It is mandated in the Quran. It is a fact that over the course of most of Islamic history, the jizya was paid. Recently, it has been got rid of. Why has it been got rid of? Why are Islamic State wrong to bring it back? And I don't know what the answer to that is, but I think it is incredibly important that a substantiated answer be found that will satisfy the vast majority of Muslims. When uh, Ramadan began, uh, Islamic State used Ramadan as a call to arms mm -hmm. uh, and a campaign of death on the infidels. And uh, it can't be a coincidence that there's been a number of things have, have happened since. Now, that's one interpretation Islamic State put on. What, what I was looking for, but we didn't hear out of Saudi Arabia or uh, out of uh, other uh, great centers of learning on Islam, was any kind of counterversion that said, no, this is nonsense, this is, uh, this is not what Islam teaches. This is not what the Quran teaches. Well, I th and I think the other, the other danger I think David Cameron was trying to avoid is the idea that we take on, as it were, all the cultural responsibility for what's going on. And it's right that, that you don't hear, I don't think you hear the voices from within what you, I think, rightly call an existential debate. Mm. But I'd love to know what term, how Tom defines that ex existential crisis, what that actually means. Because I think, I think we're having this debate through a very kind of our prism, without really understanding what's going on there. Tom has, I think, highlighted that really well in the film, but I'd love to know what you think that existential crisis is and how well, that's going to play out. Let's hear that and then I'll come to Michael. Well, I, th I think that um, there is an incredibly rich tradition within Islamic scholarship and spirituality of interpreting these texts, and particularly the example of Muhammad in an almost mystical sense. What the Islamic State are doing is to take Quranic mandates and sayings of Muhammad, and indeed the example of the Prophet, and apply them with an absolutely brutal mm. literalism. Mm. And th the existential crisis, I think, is that Muslims have to say, well, why, are the, why, is, it, why is this approach wrong? I mean, I, I think that it is incredibly telling that a lot of the most savage um, terrorists... Why are, they, why are they so scared to do that? Apart from the obvious. Because I think that it's incredibly painful, ultimately, and very difficult. And I think that, you know, this is, this is, uh, has really only happened over the past few years. Yeah. Okay. And I think it needs to, I think the solution is still brewing. I mean, I hope that it is arrived at. Michael, you wanted to come in. Well, I was struck that on the one hand, David Cameron seemed to be objecting to the use of the words Islamic State, particularly by the BBC, uh, out of a sort of political correctness that he didn't wish to offend the Muslim community. On the other hand, he appeared very willing to offend the Muslim community with the sort of implication that a big part of our problem was a kind of soft, mm. quiet acceptance of terrorism, that this was one of the causes of what was going wrong, was that people were not willing to speak up, to denounce, to uh, stop families from moving abroad to Syria and so on and so on. And so, you know, even here there seemed to be a confusion on the one hand, being afraid to offend, on the other, on the other hand, being kind of really uh, rather willing to offend. Mm. Finally, Tom, you study these things uh, carefully and there's debate going on within Islam. How do you perceive the scale of the threat of Islamic State? Uh, pretty substantial, I think, because I think that even if, say, there is military intervention and they get destroyed, the ideas will not be destroyed, and ultimately it is ideas that are more dangerous than men with guns. Tom Holland, thank you.